Hi, my name is Mitch, and today we're going to be moving on to our 20th presidential biography. And that, of course, means we're going to be focusing on our 20th president, Rutherford Burchard Hayes. So, Rutherford Burchard Hayes was born in Delaware, Ohio, on October 4th, 1822. His parents being named Rutherford and Sophia. Now, many people will point out that Burchard is kind of a strange middle name. Uh, but a custom of the time period was that sometimes parents would name their sons, their middle names for their sons would be the maiden name of their mother. <clears throat> thus, Sophia, her maiden name was Sophia Burchard, and thus their son, Rutherford Burchard Hayes, was given that middle name. Now, unfortunately, Rutherford's father died before he was born, and the young Rutherford was raised by his mother and his uncle Sardis, who was very influential on his life. However, Rutherford was a very sickly child, and he spent his early years mostly being educated by his mother. He did briefly attend a local public school, but most people, including himself, don't, didn't really consider him having formal education until he started attending private schools, which he was able to thanks to the support of his uncle Sardis. And then after, uh, after coming of age, he would begin his studies at Kenyon College in Ohio. Now he would graduate as a valedictorian of, class, uh, of his class, uh, naturally he's a very studious boy. And then he went on to study in a law office in Columbus to become a lawyer naturally. And then after doing that, he was uh, he was admitted to Harvard Law School. He then, uh, after graduating from Harvard, uh, he opened a law practice in the city of Sandusky in Ohio. Now, as a as operating his own law practice, he did not do very well for himself necessarily. Uh, he got some cases, but they weren't nearly as important as he was hoping for and his practice was not taking off the way he had hoped uh and this this led him to move to the big city of cincinnati in ohio to begin working as a criminal law attorney and he would often as uh working in cincinnati as a lawyer he would often defend the kind of outcast in the society those who live outside the the fold really and those who could not really afford proper lawyers themselves uh and he would often take up those cases uh remembering his humble roots now while there in cincinnati he ended up courting a woman named lucy ware webb who was from his hometown of delaware uh, and he had known lucy for some time she was the uh, daughter of his mother's close friend uh, and the two were uh became very close and they were married in 1852 when Rutherford was 30 years old. They had eight children together, uh, their names being Burchard, James, Rutherford, Joseph, George, Fanny, uh, who was uh, one of the favorites actually of Rutherford. Uh, and they would spend, uh, of her father, they would spend a lot of time together, especially during his post presidency years. Uh, and the last two children being named Scott and Manny though both of them, or though Manning, unfortunately, passed away in infancy. Now, Lucy was very influential on her husband, and she convinced Rutherford to become an abolitionist. She came from a strictly abolitionist family. And Rutherford, standing up for the little guy, as always, he took up the cause of abolition, mainly because of Lucy's uh, influence on him. And he ended up defending many runaway slaves in Ohio, which was a free state, but also bordered the slave state of Kentucky, and especially in Cincinnati, which was right on the border with Kentucky. It was, or is right on the border with Kentucky. It was a massive uh, refuge for runaway slaves, per se, and Rutherford took up many of their cases and defended them against their former masters. Now, Rutherford emerged as a strong Republican, naturally becoming, as he was an abolitionist, the Republicans were the abolitionist party. And Hayes, as such, 
became a Cincinnati city councilor in 1858, and he served there for three years into the opening days of the Civil War. Now, he was not uh he was he was not opposed to the idea of secession but he thought that like like the president lincoln he thought that the united states the federal government should hold on to its property in the south and so when the federal entity of fort sumter in charleston harbor in south carolina was attacked Hayes felt compelled to join the Union Army as he felt that the federal government of the Union was at stake. Now, Rutherford had no military experience. He was a lawyer his whole life, and he was a weak child, so naturally, being in the military was not uh, something he was expecting to do. But nonetheless, he found himself in the Union Army compelled by patriotism, and as he had good standings with a number of uh high ohio politicians he was quickly appointed a major now he went to serve in the maryland campaign but early on in 1862 he was injured at the battle of south mountain now after spending some time being nursed back to health he was promoted to the rank of colonel thereafter he led troops through the shenandoah campaign in virginia which proved to be one of the most important of the war and really ended it um really really contributed to the end or at least to the surrender of general robert lee now unfortunately again in 1864 he was injured at the battle of cedars creek after serving bravely in a number of other battles in the campaign and so though cedar creek would be his last battle he was appointed a brigadier general for his valiant service in the war thus far. Now, while he was serving in the army, Hayes was elected to the House of Representatives, and he was uh, it was so by he was so by his some of his friends in Ohio submitting his name and putting him on the ballot, but he wasn't able to campaign. He was doing his duty fighting in the war. And so he was elected to the House of Representatives without ever campaigning and while serving actively in the military. Uh, and this was in 1864, I believe. Now, his war, his term in the House began just before the war ended in 1865, but he didn't resign from the army until a couple months after the surrender of General Robert E. Lee in April 1865, which ultimately ended the war. And again, we talked about this in the uh, in the Lincoln and Grant videos. Now, after this, Hayes took his seat in the House of Representatives, and as a staunch Republican from the start of his career, he supported the radical Republican legislation throughout the uh, Johnson administration. And uh, as we explained in the Johnson videos, in the last few videos, Johnson was a Democrat who was put on the ticket as sort of a compromise, the National Union ticket. And so with Johnson being really a Democrat in the presidency, him and the Congress did not very much get along as Congress was completely controlled by the radical Republicans. Now, Hayes being a radical Republican supported a lot of this legislation that the president was opposed to. And one of these was uh, one of the major pieces of legislation that he helped so that he supported was the 14th amendment which provided that no one should be denied citizenship based on their uh based on their race um and this naturally granted or ensured the citizenship of thousands tens of thousands of free men actually probably millions of free men across the entire south now in 1867 after serving just i think like one and a half terms uh he resigned from the house uh in order to run for the ohio governorship and this he he won pretty pretty handily the ohio being in the north and the north being solidly in the hands of the radical republicans now he campaigned for the governorship uh supporting the idea of granting suffrage to african americans granting them the right to vote but Democrats in the state legislature, at least in Ohio specifically, but the Democrats who gained control of the state legislature blocked his move to grant these, uh, to grant the 
African Americans the right to vote. Now, nonetheless, he was able to do it anyway, because the 15th Amendment came around afterwards, and through some handy maneuvering, he was able to get the 15th Amendment ratified in, the, in Ohio, which uh, helped nationwide grant, the, uh, grant everyone the right to vote, every citizen the right to vote, regardless of race. And so, even though the Democrats were able to block him granting Ohioans O Ohioans? Ohioans, the right to vote, or the black Ohioans, the right to vote. All, all African Americans were legally under the law allowed to vote based on the 15th Amendment, though, of course, in reality, a large number of them would not be able to do so for almost 100 years. Now, in 1871, he was uh, re-elected as governor, but he left in 1872 uh, in order to run for another term in the House. Uh, as he thought it was more important for him to be in the federal government uh, during the Grant administration. Now, he ended up losing that campaign, and he was not elected back to the House. So, Hayes then briefly retired from politics, although, of course, this wouldn't be his last, this wouldn't be the end of him, his political career, uh, and he ended up aiding his beloved Uncle Sardis, who had cared for him as a young child, um, in his final days and in caring for his estate. However, he didn't stay idle for very long. In 1875, he ran again for the governorship and won once more. Although he would only briefly serve as the governor, as in 1876, he is the Republican nominee for president. So at this point, President Grant it, it denies or doesn't want to run for a third term uh, in, in, in accordance with Washington's precedent. Uh, precedent. And Hayes is a natural, naturally great candidate. I mean, he was a Civil War hero. He was a well-known governor. He had served in the House of Representatives. He knew Washington. He knew how to appeal to common, common people, which was uh, a big demographic of the Republican Party. So Hayes was a natural candidate for the presidency. On the other hand, we see Samuel Jones Tilden, uh, the the governor of New York, I believe, uh, as the Democratic candidate. And this election is very close. This is actually the closest election in history. So Hayes undoubtedly loses the popular vote. Uh, the Democrats win the, win the popular vote handily. But the Electoral College is a bit more iffy. So what happened was in the South, um, there was... Two slates of electors chosen because the Republicans were still trying to hold on to control there, but naturally the large, the majority of people in the South were supportive of the Democrats uh, as the Republicans destroyed the South during the Civil War. And so because of this, two slates of electors were uh, chosen in many of these Southern states, and thus no one knew who the real electors were. were. And so the... Uh, it's decided that a commission, an electoral commission, will be chosen or will be created to determine who wins the election and who who gets each slate of electors or which slate of electors is the real slate. Now, eight of the 15 members of the committee are Republicans and seven of them are Democrats. So naturally, who are they going to choose to win the election? The Republicans, of course, because they have the majority of the commission. So every single state that was in question goes to the Republicans, and thus this gives Hayes the electoral victory by just one vote, and that is the closest in the the closest in the electoral college has ever been, unless you unless you count the tie between Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson in 1800. Now, so Hayes becomes the second person to win the Electoral College, but not the popular vote, the first being John Quincy Adams. So Hayes naturally enters office with an extremely weak mandate, as many people see the election as corrupt and completely stolen from the Democrats, as in reality, the Democrats probably should have won the election in 1876. So in order to ensure that the Democrats do not riot in the streets, Hayes makes a compromise with them. Tilden actually is supportive 
of Hayes being uh, chosen. And Tilden, not wanting to see the country torn apart again, only, what, 12 years or 11 years after the Civil War ended, he doesn't want to see the country torn apart again. And so, because the election was so close and controversial, Hayes makes a number of backroom deals with the commission and with Tilden uh, in order to sort of settle things with the Democrats. And this became collectively known as the Compromise of 1877. Now, one of these agreements was that Hayes would withdraw federal troops from the South. And this was huge because this was, if you watch the Grant video, this was a huge source of contention during the Grant administration that he was allowed in order to uh, in order to facilitate Reconstruction, he was allowed to send federal troops into the South to really instate martial law. And this was incredibly unpopular throughout the South, naturally. And so Hayes agrees that he will remove the federal troops from the South. And this is widely seen as the end to Reconstruction, as they're basically leaving the South on its own, leaving them to their own devices. Now, like I said, this 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 naturally leaves the South to do whatever it wants because there's no federal troops to enforce anything there. So things like the Civil Rights Act and the Ku Klux Klan Act that are meant to protect free men in the South were were gone, and there was no enforcing of any of these laws, and thus free men in the South were subjected to segregation, discrimination, terrorization, all kinds of unimaginable uh, persecution by by white Southerners for the most part, uh, and, and definitely the Ku Klux Klan. And so this is, this was kind of an impossible thing to end Reconstruction without removing those federal troops. But again, it subjects these freedmen in the South to the t terrorization that they were subjected to uh, immediately following the Civil War. Now, in addition, Hayes agrees, as part of the compromise, to appoint a Southerner to his cabinet. Now, many people would have been okay for the, they, they, they would have thought it questionable, but many Republicans would have been fine if he chose just a, a normal Southern politician who had no ties to the Old South, but instead he chooses an ex-Confederate to be appointed to his cabinet. I forget, I forget his name and his position, but he appoints an ex-Confederate to his cabinet, which raises many Republican eyebrows, as we weren't that far removed from the Civil War. And here Hayes was appointing an, an ex-Confederate, the enemy, really, who was seen as the enemy of the state at the time, to his cabinet. And he also agreed to fund internal improvements throughout the southern states. So while this makes him a little controversial, actually very controversial among the Republicans, He's not so despised in the South, even though he's the Republican, because he ends Reconstruction and he supports internal improvement throughout the South to finally rebuild them. And he's not opposed to working with ex-Confederates as other as other Republicans were. Now, Hayes takes office during the Panic of 1873. So again, if you watch the Grant video, Panic of 1873 begins because of uh, depreciation of gold and controversy over the use of paper money rather than gold or specie, or actually, yeah, rather than gold or specie. So the Panic of 1873 is one of the worst economic disasters of the century, and it continues for five years. And so that continues into, well, into the, grant, uh, the, the Hayes administration. And so in order to uh, stay viable during the panic and the, the recession, many railroad companies, which were booming at the time, because like we said before the uh, in other videos, the country was connected virtually entirely by railroads. And so railroads were the ultimate source of transportation and were of utmost importance to the country at the time. And so with the panic continuing, many railroad companies were forced to cut the pay for their workers. And this resulted in, uh, in, a, it resulted in a series of strikes by railroad workers across the country beginning in 1877. And this presented mass, massive issues for the industry. Many lines went, did not operate. 
they, they, they were forced to stop and the country was uh, kind of put at a standstill because they were not able to move as they were able to previously. And so in order to solve this problem, Hayes decides to use federal troops, to institute federal troops to break up these strikes. And this led to hundreds of deaths and the stigma that the federal government was against strikes and unions. Now, while this may have been unpopular, while this was extremely unpopular amongst the railroad workers, the railroads were function were fully functioning again by October. Uh, so the use of the federal troops did get things working again, but still, again, contributed to that Gilded Age stigma that workers were being suppressed and that they couldn't, uh, they weren't, they weren't allowed, they weren't able to strike or change things in that manner. Now, again, with the working conditions of the time, there were increasing conflicts across the country, but primarily in California, over minority groups squabbling over jobs. So, a little bit of background, for some time, Chinese immigrants and their descendants had taken up the low-paying jobs in California, mainly, on the West Coast, as they come over across the Pacific, that just white Americans didn't want. They were low-paying, they were grimy, they were dirty, they were blue collar, but the the Chinese immigrants were happy to take up these jobs as they were just happy to work in general. But these kind of undercutted the pay, payment of other jobs, uh, of other workers. And so when these jobs began to fill up or disappear, the Chinese were forced to look for other work. And they ended up seeking positions predominantly held by Irish Americans on the West Coast. Now, the problem was the Chinese were able, were were happy to work for less pay, far less pay than the Irish were receiving. So the Irish, the Irish descended, the Irish Americans were losing their jobs to the Chinese who were willing or having their pay cut because the Chinese were willing to work for less. And so the Irish Americans in the air in California believed this incredibly unfair as they thought it was their right to have these jobs as they had been there far longer than the Chinese. Now their solution was to just violently attack the Chinese immigrants, the Chinese Americans in California. And Congress's solution to this violence was to pass an act banning the entirety of Chinese immigration. And while this might sound like a crazy solution, it became law uh, just two years later. And we will talk about this later. We'll talk about this in the Arthur video, but the Chinese were not seen as favorable immigrants, which is just terrible to, terrible xenopho xenophobia, but it was the reality of the time. Now, President Hayes thought this was too harsh an idea. And instead, he sent his Secretary of State to draft the Angel Treaty of 1880, which uh, was signed with the agreement of China to severely limit the amount of immigrants able to come over from China into the United States. And this was seen as a, seen as a good compromise at the time, I suppose, but relations, harsh relations, violent relations between the Chinese Americans and the Irish Americans would continue forever basically they would continue for many decades to come now one thing that another thing that Hayes had to deal with was the corruption that plagued the grant administration uh and if you watch the grant video you would know this occurred in a number of ways including the spoil system in which people in the federal government were given jobs specifically because they had relationships or they had done something for the for their superiors. And Hayes was particularly opposed to the spoil system, while other presidents, like Jackson, had openly supported the spoil system. Hayes thought that it was an extension of the corruption of the Gilded Age, and he worked hard to end it in the federal government. And he put in place measures to ensure that any civil servant, anyone in the government, received their post on merit instead of their relationship or, or quid pro quo, what they had done for their superiors. And Congress was so Congress liked Congress, I would say, had had uh, had benefits from the spoil system. They could get things from each other. They could get they could get benefits from from organizations, from things like that. 
And so Congress was slow to act and slow to support the end to the spoil system. However, Hayes moved right along and removed several people from their offices who had gained them from the uh, from the spoil system. One of these was actually Chester Arthur, who would become president not a year later, not a year after uh, Hayes leaves office, uh, which is kind of a little coincidental thing there. But hey, Arthur was the portmaster of New York City, and Hayes fervently believed men like Arthur were abusing their posts um, and were only put there because of their connections. And Hayes very much uh, opposed that system. Now, after the mess of the 1860, 1876 election and the weak mandate he had at the time, Hayes had promised he wouldn't run again in 1880. And this was another way of him uh, strengthening his mandate after after it was so weak going into office, promising not to run again definitely helped his case. Now, whether he regretted this promise or not, he retired in 1881 to a Spiegel Grove estate in Fremont, Ohio, and there he supported a number of causes. He was very active in his retirement, um, and he supported uh, reforms to public education, actually even increasing the amount of education given to both black people and white people. Uh, he also supported prison reform um, and thought that many in, many of the incarcerated were being treated ridiculously unfairly uh, and dangerously. And he also went on many trips and enjoyed spending time with his family in his retirement. Now, he passed away on January 17th, 1893 from a heart attack um, it ha at his Spiegel Grove estate, and he was buried on the grounds uh, of his estate in Ohio. So that's going to do it for our biography on Rutherford Richard Hayes. Our next video is going to focus on his successor, James Abram Garfield. So you can look forward to that. Thanks for watching.